but we're going through it, so that's okay. What the professor meant was don't plagiarize. Don't just take some other guy's sermon. You preach it like as if God laid it on your heart. So we're looking at Acts chapter 3, verse 19. I'm going to read 19 to the end of the chapter. This is the second part of his sermon. And then we're going to go through it together. So Acts 3, 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. He shall send Jesus Christ, which before you was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said these days, ye are children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you, first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Now this is a, it's a tough passage because there's a lot of heavy stuff in this. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through this little by little. I would say this, I'm going to put in a plug for Wednesday evening, talking to Dr. Harrison this Wednesday, he's going to be finishing up his teaching on Israel. Those of you who have been here know it's been very valuable. He went through the history of the land of Israel, back to the Ottoman Empire, the Balfour Agreements, and all those things that have led up to where we are. And to put it in perspective, and we're going to finish, he's going to finish that up this week. We're going to deal with some of these things, I believe, Wednesday night. So if you're curious about this and want to dig deeper, come out Wednesday night. What, 4 o'clock? Is that right? 4 o'clock, 4 to 7. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The word repent, metaneo, it just simply means to change your thinking. Meta, change. Maneo is your thinking, change your thinking. What Peter is telling them to do is, you got to change something. Think in this way, now you got to think this way. Change, repent. And then he says, be converted, verse 19. Be converted. It just simply means to turn around, to turn. Change your thinking and turn. Your thinking is the way of the world, the way the world thinks. When the Spirit of God begins to work in your hearts, there's a change. You don't think the way the world. The Old Testament says he's put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. You had an old song, now you got a new one. Remember the example of the prodigal son? I thought of this. If you, you read in Luke chapter 15, remember when he asked his father for his inheritance and he went out and spent it? He had one way of thinking. What was it? my way. I don't care about dad. I consider him you know, as good as dead. I want my inheritance. Took the money. He's thinking a certain way. And if you read Luke 17, he's sitting in a pig pen and he's so hungry he wants to eat the pig food. And it says he came to himself. He had a change of thinking. He's like, what am I doing? It says he's sitting there, ready to eat the pig food. He's been thinking a certain way, change of thinking. Up until then, he didn't care anything about home. He left home, and he's on his own. He wants to do what he wants to do. Now, all of a sudden, he's starting to think about home. What brought that about? Well, God let him get to the bottom. So he's thinking this way. Home is out of his mind. He's left. See you, Dad. See you, guys. Man, I'm doing my own thing. Then when he gets to the lowest point, he turns and he thinks about home. Total change. And then, verse 18, he says, I will go. I'll arise and go back to my father. And I'll say, I've sinned against you, heaven and earth. Please let me come back as one of your servants. So what do we do? We see a change of thinking. He left home, but now he's thinking about home again. And now he makes a decision. He's converted. He says, I'm going back change of direction. It's exactly what Peter's saying. 
when repentance and conversion are part of preaching. Look at Acts 20. Here's what Pete, this is what Paul says when he's standing before King Agrippa. He says, but he showed, but showed first unto them of Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. Look what it says. So going back to Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Peter talks about repentance. You know, repentance is not a real popular word today. If you listen to many preachers, especially those with prosperity gospel, what they say is, you know what? Accept Jesus and he will do all kinds of things for you. He will provide for you. Your life is going to be better. You know what I find? I find the preachers in the Word said, you need to hit the lowest spot in your life and you need to realize you're a dirty, rotten sinner. And you need to quit doing that and thinking that way. You've got to think differently. Repentance is not a real common sad people, right? Do I really want to upset people? Do I want to make them angry? Like, really, I have to leave my sin? I can't just have my own life and add God to it? Peter goes, no. You give up your life. You give up the way you think. You give up what you're doing, and you now follow a new master. Sounds a little radical, doesn't it? That's Peter's preaching. Let's look at something here. I wrote, at the moment of salvation, I think I only, let's see, one, two, three, four, 16 of them here. Do you realize that when you became a Christian, there were amazing things that happened? Look at the things that happened. Repentance. Converted. The Bible says you were justified. That means God looked at you as if, legally, you had not committed those. You're united with Christ. You're redeemed. You bought, you've been bought back out of the slave market of sin. You're born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. You've been translated, it says, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You're sealed. God puts his stamp, his seal on you, which is the Holy Spirit, saying, you are mine. You're reconciled. Reconciled is two things that don't get along or brought together. You're a sinner. God is holy, and somehow the two meet. You've been adopted into his family. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You're made complete. You're forgiven. Wow. You're delivered. You now have an inheritance. You have a new citizenship. Think of all the things that happened when you became a Christian. Now, some people like to say, well, which one happened first? And which one happened next? The Bible doesn't tell us which one happened. It just says it's a package deal. When you repent and you have a new way of thinking, and you've been converted, and now you're following a new master, all this stuff happens to you at once. Did you realize that? That when you asked the Lord, let's say, into your heart, because the Bible says Christ in you and you in him, he is in you, did you know all this stuff happened? Did you, did you fully comprehend all this? We have a lifetime to figure this out. Just sit in amazement and look at these things that God did for you, and you, you and I didn't even know and as we walk through life and we read God's word, this becomes evident to us. All the work he did for you. Find out all the things that happened to you the minute you accepted Jesus. Let's read all 48 of them. Okay, let's look at uh, verse 19. He continues by saying, Repent therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. What's that mean? That means the sins are erased. They're gone. Did you know that? When you repented and you were converted, God took everything from your past and blotted it out. It's gone. Then it says, times of refreshing. Verse 19. Times of refreshing shall come in the presence of the Lord. I wrote here three results. There are three things, really, that resulted when you repented and were converted. That's what he says here. Times of refreshing come. What's that mean? 
What's a time of refreshing? Well, before you were a believer, you had the weight of sin and guilt on you. Remember we said about all those things that happened? Let me go back here. Romans talks about that. We don't have to sin anymore. If we sin, it's because we choose to. We don't have to. A person who's not a child of God has to sin. They have no other choice. They live in sin. Justified. It's like you have a legal document saying, I didn't do it. <laughs> I'm free. Yay! How refreshing is that? All right. Verse 26, if you want to jump down there, I'm going to jump ahead here. Here's another result. Verse 26 says, Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. We have the blessing of Jesus. You ever realize what a blessing that is to have Jesus? That God sent his son. What's Job 3.16 say? For God so loved the world, right? That he gave his only begotten son. What a blessing. Well, let's keep going here. I'm going to talk about the time of refreshing. It says a, the time of refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. These times of refreshing... This is where it gets kind of deep, so hold, stick with me here. Verse 20, it says, of Jesus coming back. We don't have Jesus coming back yet. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. And what he has done in you is a time of refreshing. He gives you relief from the sin. I thought it was... You know when, after the second plague, I believe it was, Pharaoh goes... Oh, I don't like that plague. And then after it left, it says Pharaoh had a time of refreshing. You know what that means? The plague had left. And he goes, where he thought it were. You are in Christ and he is in you. He has come into your life. What a blessing to have Jesus. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 20. And he will send Jesus which before was preached unto you, Jesus is going to be sent. Now, this is where it gets tough, so stick with me here. He's talking to Jewish people, right? Jesus has already died and rose and gone to heaven. Peter says God's going to send Jesus back. When's that going to happen? And then verse 21 it gets a little deeper. Look at this. Whom the heaven must receive, that means Jesus has got to stay in heaven until the time of restitution of all things, which God spoke by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So I wrote here, Jesus stays in heaven until the time of restitution. The prophets talked about this restitution. I listed at least <coughs> twice that I could find two prophets talked about the time of restitution. Now, Again, I'll put a plug in for this Wednesday. We're not going to take the time to delve deeply into this today, come Wednesday. Because you need to see God's time clock. Who is this? Who are these people, these Israelis or Israelites or Jews? And how do they fit into God's timeline? Peter says here that Jesus is going to be sent back from heaven, but not until... Israel is restored. Well, what's that? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you got to come Wednesday. No, not really. Let's keep going here. Uh, <coughs> Moses spoke about the coming judgment. Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto your brethren like unto him. Shall you hear in all things what's where he says to you? Verse 23. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear the prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Back in Deuteronomy, Moses was the one that said, Another prophet is coming. The great prophet. Remember what they said to John the Baptist? John the Baptist is out there baptizing. 
And they called him in, John chapter 1. They said, are you that prophet? What prophet? The prophet that Moses talked about. Are you him? Are you that guy? See, they knew God was going to send a prophet. And if they didn't listen to him, they'd be judged. That's what it says in Deuteronomy. Peter says it here, verse 23. It shall come to pass that every soul which doesn't hear that prophet. Which one? The one that Moses talked about. What's going to happen? Shall be destroyed from among the people. Ooh. You better listen to that prophet. Well, first of all, we need to find out who is he? Well, he's not John the Baptist, because John the Baptist said, I'm not him. Who is that prophet? Verse 24, the prophets told you this, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed, and as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. So he says, listen, the prophets all talked about this one prophet who would come. Remember when Jesus was walking on the road to Emmaus? Remember this? After he rose from the dead. It had been three days. Two of the disciples are walking along and they're downhearted. Jesus walks up beside them. Read it in Luke 24. And Jesus says, how come you guys are so downhearted? And they go, aren't you? Are you the only one that doesn't know what's going on around here? You see, we thought that this man Jesus was going to be the one, the prophet. Of course, Jesus is standing right there with him, right? Let me read this for you, Luke 24. You want to turn there, 13. Two of them went by the same day to a village called Emmaus. Verse 14, they talked together of all the things which had happened. Verse 15, came to pass that while they communed, Jesus drew near and went with them. But their eyes were hidden. They should not know him. Jesus said, what manner of communication are these that you have? And as you walk, why are you so sad? One of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem that has not known the things which are come to pass? Jesus said to them, What things? They said, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and before God and all the people, now the chief priests and our rulers delivered him and condemned him to death. Verse 21, But we trust him that it had been he which should redeem Israel. Besides all this, this is the third day. In other words, we thought he was going to be the one. Verse 22, Yea, certain women of our company, which were early at the sepulcher, when they found not the body, they came saying they had seen a vision of angels, that he was alive. And then verse 25, he said to them, O fool, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So what's Jesus' first words? You should have read what the prophets said. All right, what did the prophets say? Verse 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning them. So, but what did Jesus do? I've often said, well, I wish I could do this. I wish I could start at Moses and go through the history of the Old Testament and show Jesus. And that's what he did. As they're walking along, he's probably saying, remember Moses? Remember what he said in Deuteronomy, that a prophet was coming? That was me. And then remember in Deuteronomy and Leviticus when they had, had to offer the law, the sacrifices? That was a picture of me. And then he go, He opened up the entire Old Testament and showed them it all pointed to him. I wish I could do that. I wish you could too. Because that's the key. All of the prophets spoke of Jesus who was coming. He opened the scriptures. And then in verse 25, you are the children of the prophets and of the covenants. Now he's speaking to Jewish people. 
which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. You're included in these promises, Jewish people. All of these Old Testament prophets who were speaking of Jesus were speaking to you. You're a part of this. You're living as a part of what God is doing. Verse 26, unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. You see, the Jews had the first chance to believe. When Jesus came, it was a legitimate offer of his Messiahship. He came to his own, John says, and his own, what? Received him not. But as many as received him, that's you and me, he gives us the right to become the children of God. So the Jews had the first chance to believe. But what happened? And this is where the timetable is so important. We need to understand what was God doing. Well, he sent Jesus. Jesus made a legitimate offer to them. There was one time where he, he sat over... Uh, looking over Jerusalem, and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and slays those that are sent to thee. How often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks, and you would not. What's that mean? He came, he presented himself as the prophet, just what Moses said. What'd they go? What'd they say? We don't want you. And when he stood there before Pilate, and Pilate said, Behold your king. What do I do with your king? It was the religious leaders and the people that said, Away with him. Crucify him. It was the official rejection of the nation of Israel for their Messiah. He had entered Jerusalem, and they said, Behold, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Palm Sunday, remember? Mm -hmm. But then a week later, what are they doing? Away with him. Crucified. He's not what we thought. We thought we were going to get a conqueror. We get a guy riding a mule or a donkey. That's not what we thought. So as he stands there before Pilate, and Pilate says, here's your king. What do you want? We don't want him. Ultimate rejection. So Jesus came, presented himself as Messiah, the evidence of his miracles and his teaching, and they go, we don't want him. Now, what happened in the time clock of, of Israel? Israel rejected their Messiah. We don't want him. So what did God do? Well, you have to read the book of Romans to get the full picture, but Paul grieves for his countrymen. Paul was a Jew, and he grieved. Here, let me read this for you. For I would not, brethren, that you be ignorant of the mystery. See, this was a mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So all Israel will be saved. It is written, there will come out of Zion a deliverer shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Stick with me here. Blindness has come on Israel. If you talk to Israelis, Jews today, there's a blindness. Yeah. Here's, here's how it happened. Jesus came, presented himself as their Messiah. What did they do? We don't want you. We don't want you. So what did God do? Blinded them and opened the door to the Gentiles. Remember Peter? On this rock, I will build my called out ones, something new. Out of every tribe and nation and kindred and tongue, I'm going to have a kaleo, a called out people. Jews, you're blinded. Because I'm doing a work here. And even Paul says that when God is at work in us Gentiles, we are causing the Jews to be jealous. Why? Because they missed their chance. They rejected the legitimate offer of a Messiah. And now that God's working with the Gentiles, the Jews are over here, blinded, 
half blinded, he says, blindness in part. But they're looking and they're going, look what God's doing with them. How come he's not doing it with us? <laughs> because you rejected him. That's why. Yeah. He came. You didn't want it. So let me read this again. Paul grieves for his own people. Because Paul now is a member of this group, the Kaleo people, the Kaleo, the Ecclesia, called out once, and he's looking back at his own people and going, oh, if you had only received him. But of course, you can't change history. And what's really interesting, too, is that God had already said that was going to happen. Yeah. That the Messiah would come as a suffering servant. Mm -hmm. And then he would come later as a conquering king. He came as a suffering servant. What did they do? Kill him. So let me read this again. For I would not, brethren, he's writing the Gentiles, by the way, not Jews, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles. Now that's, a, that's an interesting concept. The fullness of the Gentiles. Let me see if I explain it this way. The rejection happened. God turned to the Gentiles. And there's a time that he's going to be working with the Gentiles. Until it's fullness. What's that mean? Until God is done in his plan and purpose with the Gentiles. When there's a fullness. When he's completely done all the work. With the Gentiles, then guess what? He's going to go back to the Jews. What's going to happen to those Gentiles? Come Wednesday, you'll find out. <laughs> What's the next thing on the time clock for the Gentiles that God's working with? <laughs> and then guess what? He's back to working with the, the Jews. And personally, in my study... I believe that the tribulation is a time for the Jews. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not called the time of the church's trouble. The time of Jacob. That's going to be a time of purifying where God is going to once again work with the Jewish people. There's going to be a temple. They're going to sacrifice. God's going to once again work with the Jews and he's going to purify them. And then guess what? He's coming back on a white horse. The Battle of Armageddon, when all the countries come together to wipe out the Jews, God says, enough. And he rescues his people. That's the timeline. Now, Peter isn't explaining all of that here. He's just giving us little bits and pieces that we can chew on. Well, let's go back. Let's go back to verse, I'll, I'll just read that one more time. Verse 20. After he said, you need to repent and, con and be converted and have times of refreshing. Verse 20, then he will send Jesus. Verse 21, whom the heaven must receive. He's got to stay in heaven until the times of restitution of all things. When is Jesus coming back? When Israel is, has been purified and they've once again turned to their Messiah. Once again, they realize what they did, and they go, okay, now we're ready, and he'll come back. Let me talk about some application points. You think, do you thank God continually for the work that he did for you in saving you? Remember that picture of all those things that happened at once? Just take a little bit of time and go through those and go, wow, he sealed me with his Holy Spirit. I'm his. He put that stamp, that seal on me, that is basically, what he said is, here, I'll give you this, and that's proof that you are mine. Mm -hmm. Bought, redeemed, bought out of the slave market of sin, that's what redeemed means. Ex agorazo means out of, the, out of the market. You, he went to the market, the slave market, that you and I were slaves to sin, and he bought you out of that market. Redeemed, ex agorazo, brought out of the market. What an incredible picture. Let that sink in for a minute. You know, in our history of our nation, we've got terrible things that happened in slavery. Can you just picture the slaves up there for sale? And someone coming along and saying, I want that one. 
And not just buying it for themselves, but buying it to free them. That's the full picture. He bought you to free you from that. Think of some of those other ones. Reconcile. Sinful man and holy God could never come together. And yet what did he do? He took your sin on him, the great exchange. He who no, knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The great exchange, Luther calls. Only a loving God would do that, folks. You thank God continually for the work he did in saving you. Here's another one. Have you experienced times of refreshing? I hope you have. Forgiveness alone is a time of refreshing, right? And God forgives you of your sin. I don't think I have here, but uh, the Bible says that he's removed our, transgress our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. You ever thought about that? Mm -hmm. North and south are points on the globe. You go north, there comes a point when you hit north, but then you start going oh. south again. Right. The Bible never says he removed your sins as far as the north is from the south because that's a measurable distance. Right. It says east from the west. You can keep going east forever and never stop going east. Yeah. You can keep going west and never stop going west. There's a reason he used those terms. God shows us the importance of words. What does it mean, east from west? It means it's so far it can't be measured. Uh, Micah says his sins are buried in the deepest part of the sea another word picture what an amazing thing how's that well it's so far down you can't get to it remember that accident that happened yeah. recently about people that went down yeah. to see the Titanic and the vessel wasn't fit for that depth we're not made to go down there folks and so when the sins are in the deepest part what's God saying out of reach or some of us like to be scuba divers and like to keep going back and finding those sins and bringing them back up. God says, leave them there. Leave them. They're buried. All right. God is patient. Oh, here's another one. God is patient, but his patience has limits. He was patient with Israel, wasn't he? But there came a point when they said, we don't want you. God's patience was over. I wouldn't test the patience of God. <laughs> He's patient. But you don't know where that end is. And I don't know. Wouldn't it be better to just live in communion with him and not test his patience? We may not be able to explain all the work of God in bringing us to salvation. Or bringing us salvation. But we have a story to tell. I don't want you to get discouraged when you see all those things that happened the minute you were saved, you go, well, I can't explain all that. I understand. But we all have a story to tell. And it was amazing on the way to Winslow and back this week, we heard the stories of different ones who just said, let me tell you my story. Here's what God has done. And that is so encouraging. You have a story to tell. Weave into that story the things that God did for you. Tell them how you were reconciled to a holy God. Tell them how you were bought out of the slave market of sin, redeemed. Tell them how you're sealed and you know you're a child of God and nothing's going to change that. I told you, I think a couple weeks ago, about an individual that I talked to that had problems with, I don't know if I'm a Christian because I did something you know, that displeased God and so maybe I need to become a Christian again and and my whole point was, well, what does God do to describe you becoming a Christian? You're born again. Okay, you're born. It's an event in the past that has results remaining that you can't change. You can't go back and change the fact that you were born. Okay, so why would God use that picture to describe salvation? Because he wants you to know that if you're truly born, you can't change that fact. You might not like it, but you can't change it. There may be times in your life when you doubt, but go back and say, it happened, it's done, 
And guess what? I was sealed with the Spirit of God. So, devil, get out of here. I don't need to have you whispering in my ear that I might need, might not be a child of God. I know I am. All right. We have opportunities daily to put in a word for God. I would just say that. Remember Peter? He didn't plan this sermon. All he planned to do was go with John up to pray. And they met a lame man. God did a work. And then people came running. And what's he do? He takes the opportunity to preach a sermon. The first thing he said, don't look at me. Is it some great power is in me? This is, this is a God thing. And then he just went on to explain the things of God. Remember, 50 days before, what did he do? He denied his Lord. Servant girl said, aren't you one of his? Oh, I'm not one of his. But now what's he doing? He's boldly taking opportunities. Why? Because the Spirit of God was at work. You know the difference between someone who never says a word for God and those who are open about their faith? They allow the Spirit of God to work in their hearts. That's the transformation. So let's pray together. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Let's thank God for, for his word. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the example of Peter that was willing to open his mouth and just be used by you in a mighty way. And here we are 2,000-some years later, and we still have his words that we can read, and they impact our lives. Lord, help us to be students of your word. Help us to be grateful for the great work that you have done in our lives. Help us to open our mouths and share that with others and see you at work. And Lord, as we think of this area, Paul and Chino, Lord, we pray that you would continue to draw people to you, that your word would convert, your word would change, cause repentance we would be willing to follow you wholeheartedly. For some, we pray that they would come to their sentence, senses like the uh, prodigal son and come running back to the Father that they know. There might be some who have strayed from the Father, their Father God, and they need to come back. Lord, do what you need to do in their lives to bring them to that point where they are so low that they realize and come to their senses that their way is a way of destruction. They've been following the deceiver, the devil, and now it's time to turn and go back to the Father. And for those who have never heard, we pray that they would hear through us, through others, that there is a God who loves them and died for their sins and offers them a relationship as children of God. And I pray that they would be moved by the Holy Spirit to accept you into their hearts. So Lord, we pray that Paul and Chino would know there's a living God that worked that meets us here in this place and then walks with us during the week. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Alright, go ahead and stand with us and let's close with a closing song.